sector and everything have, have come in to check the lines and that, and we have had local councillors come in um, and check it out and check that we're all OK. So, um, yeah, no, we're, we're incredibly thankful for that. Um, yeah, there are other parts of Titarangi uh, that are very close to us that are cut off even more, and um, we're really feeling for them. That's Tirarangi resident Lucy there, uh, day three with no water or power. It is 22 minutes after five and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Homai or Fikaro, we would love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. Also, let us know what your biggest challenge is at the moment if you're facing flooding, 2101 on text, or you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. This is a Checkpoint weather special, and we will be with you through until 7 o'clock this evening, so do get in touch. We would love to hear from you. The email address, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. It is time to go to the headlines now. Evie's standing by. Ko Evie anō tēnei. Met Service and Civil Defence are warning of more intense rain in the next 48 hours. A heavy rain and wind warning has been upgraded to red for parts of Auckland, Coromandel and Northland from early tomorrow morning. The region has recorded 769% of its usual January rainfall. Auckland principals are backing an education ministry decision to keep the region's schools, tertiary institutions and early childhood centres closed for a week. They were scheduled to start reopening from tomorrow but will stay closed until Tuesday, February the 7th to help keep keep traffic off the road while flood hit vital infrastructure is repaired. In the Ukraine, at least one person died when a missile fired from Russia hit an apartment building in Kharkiv. Moscow is also targeting the southern city of Kherson in late night strikes. The former British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, says Vladimir Putin threatened him with a missile strike in a phone call before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mr Johnson says the comment was made after he warned the war would be an utter catastrophe. Details of the exchange have been revealed in a BBC documentary. And officials in Western Australia have called for an investigation into how a tiny radioactive capsule was lost along a 1,400 kilometre stretch of road. The capsule is part of a gauge used to measure radioactivity in oil and gas processing plants. It was lost in transit two weeks ago, somewhere between a Rio Tinto mine and a depot in Perth. Those are the headlines. Looking at traffic in the north of the North Island, the road is now closed between West Coast Road and Stony Creek Road on State Highway 16, Kaukapakapa to Makaro. In the Waikato, State Highway 1 between Cambridge and Tsido, a crash has been cleared and the road is open but there's a temporary speed limit in place. State Highway 26, Paidoa to Te Aruha is closed because of flooding and State Highway 31, Ngotutunui to Kafia slips have closed the road. State Highway 37, Hangatsuki to White Tomo Caves between the State Highway 3 roundabout and Fullerton Road is also closed because of a slip. Our next news and weather is at 5.40. Kia ora e ho. Eden Park in central Auckland was planning to switch from sports ground to community shelter until the torrential rain arrived on their doorstep. The number one and number two fields were underwater on Friday and operational officers in the lower west stand have sustained damage. Cricket games and the stadium's annual golf tournament, which was due to tee off tomorrow, has been cancelled. As Eden Park CEO Nick Sortner explains, the ground's history still causes problems today. We actually uh, were in consultation with Auckland Council around being a disaster recovery centre and housing um, people who had been displaced in shelter over the evening, uh, but it became apparent throughout the night that then uh, we had our own challenges relating to uh, the flooding um, of stormwater on both the number one and number two. Um, Eden Park in 1903 was a, a swamp and it was drained uh, to accommodate uh, being a sports field. And we continue to have a number of stormwater entrance points around the facility. Um, and obviously the infrastructure around the facility hasn't been able to cope. And we're joined now by sports reporter Felicity Reid. Felicity, bring us up to date. What's the state of the fields right now? Well, if listeners had seen any of those photos with that water creeping right onto the Eden Park turf, only really the very centre of the turf was visible uh, uh, with all of that water, they'd be surprised to know that Nick Sautner actually told me today that within 24 hours it had gone from swimming pool back to sports field. So that field is, uh, was back in 2003. It was actually 
resurfaced and put in with drainage, which is seven kilometres of drainage underneath that playing surface and surrounding area, which I think if we remember during when it's actually a sports field, it's pretty quick draining. So to have seen that, and it's obviously still in play now, to be able to have it drained straight away like that, it's those um, other rooms that he mentioned there, the um, operational offices. It's the it's a catering office, a security office and a... A turf actually like function office that have got damaged they'll need to be cleared out and it'll be clear in the next couple of days what happens there but Nick Sautner says that the um, actual grass is held up quite well and it's only the synthetic surface around the outside that would actually need replacement. So this ground is used for more than sport, right? So what damage, what impact does the damage have on future events? And one that people might be thinking about is the Ed Sheeran concert. That's right. Nick Sautner told me today that he expects all events that are on the uh, stadium schedule to go ahead without disruption. So yes, you can get to Ed Sheeran on the 10th and 11th of February. And after that as well, it's the Timashai Oh, Team Matatini, large scale uh, Cup Harker Festival will also be there in late February. Well, let's hope the weather play ball. Thank you um, very much for that. Felicity Reid, sports reporter. Auckland schools and early childhood centres have been told to keep their gates shut until next Tuesday, the day after Waitangi Day. About 20 schools in the region were badly hit by the flooding, while others have slips or grounds contaminated by flood water. Wendy Coford is the president of the Auckland Primary Principals Association, and she's also the principal at Newmarket School, and joins us now. Kia ora, Wendy. Kia ora, Lisa. What do you think of this decision? Um, it's come late um, this afternoon, but as a principal, I am a little relieved because we have no idea what tomorrow's weather bomb or um, Wednesday's is going to bring. And while my school might be fine at the moment, um, I would, n- would not like to submit children and staff to the sorts of um, uh, features that we had to traverse on Friday. So health and safety um, is paramount of everyone. And, the, and this will give people a chance to catch their breath, um, the infrastructure, um, a chance to be repaired as best it can. It's going to take some time. And also we have some of our staff affected with their own homes and they're talking about closing the bridge tomorrow with high winds. So yeah, I'm actually a little relieved because um, health and safety is so important for staff and students. Wendy, we've got a bit of a patchy line to you, so we might just get you to move a little bit so that we can hear what you've got to say. Um, parents and, and students will be interested. Um, did, did you guys lobby for the closure? Did you suggest that? You're pleased that it's happened ultimately, but no, did you ask no for No lobbying it? at all. No lobbying. In fact, all principals met this morning um, and um, it was our understanding that some of us would be um, opening tomorrow in my case um, but the inf- the information to the gov- to the Secretary of Education and to the Minister of Education was obviously a lot stronger than previously uh, um, described and they've made this decision on the, the latest information on what might we might expect in Auckland tomorrow um, but also infrastructure you know you're looking you're talking about slips you, you've seen some roads are impassable um, you know health and safety must be number one and um, I think that's been a that's been a good call it is another disruption right you've had COVID I mean how many years has it been since the school year started off smoothly Ooh, three, and we still yeah. have COVID. Uh, a colleague has COVID and three of his staff. So COVID hasn't gone away. And um, so, yeah, so there's a double impact there for some schools. Not only do they have um, grounds and buildings compromised, um, but some have staffing issues to start the year as well. Do you think it's going to cause parents and students um, a bit more anxiety? Again, another disruption. They feel like they're missing out on valuable time at school. Um, I think most parents would be pretty supportive of this move. Again, uh, uh, the, the well-being of our students and staff uh, must be to the fore, and Auckland is facing some huge challenges in um, getting back to normal. And um, you know, we want to give those people trying to repair our roads the best chance to do that. Thousands and thousands of students cross Auckland every day. You know, you're looking 20, 30,000 cars back and forward to various schools. So um, that's going to um, impact on the work people are doing. It's going to put more risk in the in the in Auckland's infrastructure, and um, that's certainly um, uh, not a desirable outcome. 
um, that we're looking for at this stage. And again, we don't know what tomorrow's weather is going to bring. Wendy, we're almost out of time, but on the question of welfare, are you are the schools turning their minds to the fact that some of these families may have lost school uniforms, um, any stationery they bought for the year, and some of them might not even be living in the district where they're enrolled to go to school? anymore Ab- because ab- of evacuation. Absolutely. And we've got quite a lot of schools that have opened doors and are housing families in the community. So schools are just are going all out to support these families and um, we'll be trying to mitigate all of those issues that you just raised. You know, Auckland uh, is has um, stepped you know, the, the generosity of Aucklanders has been huge over the last three days and schools certainly will be echoing that. Um, we want these children back at school when they can. We're looking after our communities again and we've, we've shown that we're very good at that through the COVID years and we will continue to do that. And, a, and a, a big shout out to my Auckland colleagues and um, for, for the efforts and, and their staff, the efforts that they've been putting in over this very long weekend. Thank you for joining us, Wendy. That's Wendy Coford, who's the president of Auckland Primary Principals Association there. And as you heard, so instead of throwing open their doors to students, Auckland school principals are welcoming displaced families and counting the cost of Friday's flood damage. Amy Williams has the story. Wesley Primary School Principal Lou Reddy didn't expect to start the school year with 25 people living on site. They're being looked after by the school community and the Acts of Roskill Kindness Community Emergency Hub. He says delaying the start of school is the right decision and takes some pressure off. He had planned to reopen this Friday. People need a sense of normalcy as soon as possible. Um, in many ways school is a tūranga waiwai, a safe place for our kids and we can't wait to see them. We haven't seen them for ages. Not opening till Tuesday on the Ministry's directive, Mr Reddy says some parents will be well ready for the school bell. We need to give parents the chance to work on the house and some things you can't do with kids on site. So it might take the pressure. It's a double-edged sword. If we don't open as quickly as possible, it means that parents are under pressure. He expects up to 200 children to start school next week and help is already at hand for supplies. My gut says that there's a lot more need out there, um, you know, like things like uniform. So the posts have already gone out to not worry about uniform, you know, and um, we had the Kindness Collective donate all the stationery that children will need. A five minute drive away, May Road School has also opened its doors to people displaced by the flood. Principal Linda Stewart says they plan to open after Waitangi weekend. Before then, she's not sure how many people will be staying overnight, but the doors are open. It's pretty flexible. I don't know how many people will be here tonight. Um, We're mainly catering for the New Zealand Ethnic Trust, which is Muslim women. So it's Muslim families potentially. Uh, That will change just depending on the needs. She says schools are the heart of a community. From my experience, what I see is that schools are so much the community hub. People go, they reach out to schools because they know that it's a safe place. On the North Shore, Glenfield College Principal Paul McKinley says the decision to delay the start of the school year is the right one. I think it's an appropriate decision and prudent because we need a bit of clarity and surety for the community. A lot of families out there are suffering, whether it be housing or food. You know, also mixed messages of half of Auckland are open and half aren't, and, and people travel across Auckland. It has put uh, challenges on the infrastructure and the bus systems, etc. He says parts of his school were flooded on Friday and Saturday, but it could have reopened for teaching tomorrow. Oriwa College is among the 20 schools damaged in Auckland's floods, where Principal Greg Pearce says they're trying to dry carpets in a classroom block which flooded. The school's Arts and Events Centre flooded eight months ago and flooded again on Friday and Saturday. We had no option but to rip up the carpet again, so that's going to be significant dollars again, unfortunately, but obviously with mould and the health and safety issues of not doing anything for a couple of days, which we learned from our last lesson, uh, the cost should be less. It's very frustrating that to rip up what we had laid eight months previously. With more heavy rain forecast for the next two days, people heading back to work tomorrow are advised to check roads are open. Here's Auckland Transport General Manager of Transport Services, Andrew Allen. Just requesting that Aucklanders think about and plan their travel in advance. 
um, before they head out on journeys and, and travel only where it's absolutely necessary. He says a wind warning is in place for the city and the Harbour Bridge may also close. As for the weeks ahead, principals on the front line of the flood response, like Lou Reddy, are worried some families will be left without housing. My worry is that um, they won't have uh, they won't have certainty for a while. Sorry. <laughs> All the food stuff we can do immediately, we've been doing it for a couple of years now, but it's the, it's the housing. In the meantime, he says they'll do everything they can for the families in their communities. It is 24 minutes to six, and just a public service announcement, our live streams are back online, so just search Checkpoint RNZ on YouTube or Facebook to watch us as well as listen. Kia mo tunumai, stay with us. You're listening to a Checkpoint special on RNZ National. We're with you until seven o'clock. It is time for the business news now. Ko taku hoa e nai nai, ko Nona Peltier. OK, Nona, extreme weather in parts of the country. What does this all mean for the economy? It's not good news. It's uh, going to give us a little bit of a bump in terms of GDP growth because there'll be uh, a lot of expenditure. But that expenditure in itself is going to be inflationary. There's not enough products already in the market in terms of building supplies and so on. That's going to drive up demand and prices. That's not good for the economy in a time when we're trying to get that under control. Uh, so for whatever gain there might be, it's certainly there's more offsetting than there is any upside. Uh, in terms of claims, uh, the early indicators are we've got about 11,000 claims that came in earlier today uh, probably going to have more and uh, the cost economically about a half a billion dollars so far is the estimate uh, it could get worse uh, we know that there's going to be more rain so I guess we're going to still be counting the costs tomorrow I would imagine and overall then uh, how did the market react do you think yep. well the NZ exit uh, dropped just a touch. I mean, we're talking two points down to 12,034. Uh, the New Zealand dollar, almost little changed. I mean, hardly any change at all. 64.9, 65 cents US, 91.5 Australian, and 52.4 pence. So there you go. We'll keep you up to date on what happens tomorrow. Thank you, Nona Kakite and Nona Peltier there with Business News. It is 22 minutes to six, and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Homai or Fakado, we would love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. A number of people telling us they don't have insurance. Do you have it? Let us know, and if not, why not? Is it just the cost? Text us on 2101, or you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. Email address, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. And this is a Checkpoint weather special, so we're going to be with you until 7 o'clock this evening. Do stay tuned. It is time now, though, to go to the headlines. Anea Evi, mena pita The Met Service says saturated ground in the upper North Island led to tomorrow's heavy rain and wind warning being upgraded to red as it could mean more flooding. Meteorologist Luis Fernandez says the warning starts about 4am in Northland, then moves to North Auckland in the early evening and on to the Coromandel Peninsula around midnight. A South Auckland community leader says Auckland Council's handling of the flood emergency was disgraceful. Dave Latelli told Checkpoint that the lack of teamwork and leadership meant many families were left to fend for themselves. Auckland's Mayor Wayne Brown has conceded that his and his office's communication wasn't good enough. The Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says he may allow Finland to join NATO without accepting Sweden's bid. The Nordic countries applied after Russia invaded Ukraine. Mr Erdogan is angry at Sweden's refusal to extradite suspected Kurdish militants and far-right Swedish groups burning a Koran. Israel's security cabinet has approved measures to make it easier for Israelis to carry guns after another flare-up in tensions with Palestine. Two separate Palestinian gun attacks in Jerusalem have left seven dead and at least five wounded, while a raid by the Israeli army in the north of the occupied West Bank killed nine. And the chair of Britain's governing Conservative Party has been sacked from his post and the government amid an investigation into his tax affairs. Natim Sahawi admitted incorrectly filling out his returns and having to pay a penalty. Those are the headlines. Looking at traffic, and there's plenty going on in the north of the North Island, as you can imagine. State Highway 1 at Duakaka between State Highway 15 and Marsden Point Road is open with caution, but the road may be closed again at short notice due to road conditions. State Highway 15 is closed between 
16, sorry, is closed between West Coast Road and Stony Creek Road and the Kaukapakapa Makarau Road. And State Highway 26, Paidoa to Te Aroha, is closed because of flooding. Our next news and weather is at 6 o'clock. Thank you, Evie. And we've got breaking news. Auckland Transport advises buses will replace trains between Newmarket and Britomart tomorrow after a further slip on the Western Line. The Rakino Ferry service is still unable to run due to debris in the water. And the Morningside underpass will remain closed due to flooding. AT is warning to expect longer bus journey times too. Auckland Transport Andrew Allen will join us live after six, so do stay tuned for that. While First came the floods and now a rising tide of insurance claims. So what do you need to know if your car's swamped with water or your basement carpet's coated in silt or some other stinky stuff? Well, joining us now is Tower Insurance Chief Claims Officer, Steve Wilson. Steve, give us an idea of how big this is, number of claims you're getting so far. Hi, Lisa. Yes, uh, claims are coming through. Tower's received approximately 1,900 claims since the weekend. And about a 1,000 of those are house claims and the remainder being motor and home contents claims. And we respect to receive further claims as customers assess their damage and, and obviously further weather unfolds this week. Yeah, so how are you coping with that? Have you brought on more people and, and assessors and the like? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. We were prepared from Friday evening and uh, we started sending out communications directly to our customers in those areas that were affected by the weather. Uh, and at the same time, we started to enable a workforce to work through the, the long weekend. So from Saturday morning, we were taking calls and lodging claims and helping get our, our, our Kiwi colleagues uh, just to start to assess their damage and get their claim into the system so we can start to allocate out and uh, get some assessors on the ground to go and assess them. Hey, your, your phone line's just a little bit scratchy, so we might get you to move around because um, you've got some important information for us. Assessors on the ground, how many people do you have going out and, and, um, and looking at properties, for example? Oh, look, we partner with some experts. So we've got uh, partners that are on the ground here in Auckland. We've also brought in uh, those experts that are down in the South Island. They've been able to fly up over the weekend. We've also been able to get some of our partners, uh, experts from, from Australia that are flying in. Uh, and they'll be ready on the ground this week as well. So uh, it's all hands on deck, uh, bringing the right people in, uh, and we'll be allocating out uh, out, out our claims uh, so we can get those assessed really quickly and start to evaluate uh, and, and how to recover our, our, our customers' homes. OK, so what do people need to know in terms of keeping records or evidence? Give us the what-to-do list. Yeah, look, there's absolutely some things that you can do. I think the first thing is, uh, know some of the damage that's uh, around and take some photos. Everyone's got smart devices, so it's pretty easy to capture uh, the damage. And, and especially if there's water levels on your house or, or on your car where the water's gone in, try and take some of those photos. And then it's OK to start to clean up. Uh, but keep a record of what you're cleaning up. Don't necessarily throw anything away unless it's really not safe to keep. Uh, and try and keep that so when an assessor comes out, they can evaluate that quickly. But absolutely try and clean up as much as you can, but do, do it safely. So uh, you, you, you keep the things that are that are broken or water inundated so that you, you've got evidence of what's been damaged. Is that what you're saying, like appliances and the like? Absolutely. So uh, we know that water's flooded a lot of bottom floor areas, so garages, uh, bottom floor rooms. In fact, many of our houses have had multi-bedrooms or, or, or rooms damaged. So having a look at some of the furniture, some, some appliances or or other things that may be on the ground. Um, and especially if things are wet, like uh, carpets or rugs, you, know, you may need to dispose of them pretty quickly. So don't be afraid to take some photos, uh, remove them uh, and dispose of them appropriately and, and just have that information ready for an assessor when they come out. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. That is Steve Wilson, who's Tower Insurance Chief Claims Officer. Auckland's northwest is reeling for the second time in 18 months from a major flooding event. Businesses have long lists of damaged stock and equipment. Infrastructure has been wiped out and residents face a big clean-up job. Reporter Tom Taylor and cameraman Nick Monroe have the story. History is repeating itself for Kumu business owners. Devastated by the floods of August 2021, they're once again coming to terms with storm damage that will tally millions of dollars. Huapai truck painter's owner Clive Way says after the recent experience, he knew to get himself and his staff out while he could. Basically about 1 o'clock, 1, 1.30, all that rain was coming down and it was pouring down. And then so we noticed we looked out here, being my staff, and the sheer volume of water coming down. And then uh, this driveway area right through actually flooded through to about a metre deep. 
um, by about three o'clock, and that's when we thought Shit, something's, you know, something's about to happen. You know, it's going to be a repeat of last year. Mr. Way says although he was prepared for another flood, there's still not much he can do to mitigate the damage. But the little he was able to do will help to reduce his insurance claims. By about two o'clock, we had all our tools and equipment. They're all up high. Um, so we basically, my, my insurance claim this time is going to be a lot, lot less. This 7 a.m. Down the driver OT sheet metals, tools will be down for a minimum of two months while the owners take stock of the flood. Already, Nasman Baksh says there could be as much as $280,000 worth of equipment to replace. We'll be waiting another three, four months for the machinery to be fixed or brought in. Uh, jobs get affected, so that means the staff will have less work, so they get affected as well. Um, in this time, they can't just say it is just Kumu. It is the entire of Auckland. How many places will they declare flood zone? The entire of Auckland? Over the weekend, friends and family members came to help with a massive cleaning effort. It's a tough ask considering they've done this so recently, but Ms Baksh has nothing but praise for the solidarity of the community. Since yesterday 9am we had about 35 people coming over and it took us about 6-7 hours to just take out the mud. At, the moment, I think the At Ruby Nails and Beauty, Barry Lou says although the damage to her salon isn't as bad as last time, she's already tallied up about $7,000 in lost stock and broken machines. And the only reason there's less damage this time round is because of the lessons Miss Lou learnt last time. Crucially, moving most of her stock onto shelves high on the walls. All the washing machine, the fridge was floating. Um, the big stuff is not workable at the moment, so I'm trying to... Um, to get everything dry by just a tiny dryer, so hopefully it will, it will be back. Luckily for Ms Lou, Auckland Council officers showed up at the salon while Checkpoint was visiting, with a white sticker meaning she can continue to operate. The local business association has now delivered sandbags to help prevent further damage, but many only arrived after the worst of the flooding on Friday night. Ms Lou says she'll be holding on to hers for the foreseeable future. While Kumu grapples with the damage to its businesses, a community up the road has had major infrastructure wiped out. The strength of the weekend storm was enough to sweep entire bridges away. This one, on Riverhead's Mill Flat Road, not able to withstand the sheer volume of water surging downstream. And on the other side, a small community is all but cut off, with the only access to essentials via a four-wheel drive track through the Riverhead forest. Luke Lomasalato is a delivery driver for Countdown Supermarkets. He says his last delivery across the bridge was on Thursday evening, and getting supplies may now be a lot harder for those stuck on the other side. It's, it's kind of easier for us, to, but for them it's harder for them. Because yeah. where are they going to get the groceries from? It's from here on the other side. But they have to wait when the bridge, but I don't know when they're going to build the bridge. With more rain forecast in the coming days, residents will be hoping their remaining supply routes stay open. And if you were listening to that story from Tom Taylor and filmed by cameraman Nick Monroe, the video version of that will go on to our webpage. Do check it out. It is 11 minutes to six. Kia mo tonu mai. You're listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National. The roads around the Coromandel are in an increasingly fragile state and Waka Kotahi has urged people to avoid any unnecessary travel. For more, we're joined by TENS Coromandel Civil Defence Controller Gary Towler. Gary, we're talking a bit much recent times, so how bad is it over there? Evening, Lisa. Yeah, it's a regular slot now. Um, well, yeah. Look, it's um, it is it is not good, and we've had 1.3 more than 1.3 metres of rain so far this year. So, even for us, you know, hardened um, um, people in emergency management, all of them are just saying, "Man, we've just never been here before." And as a result, the roads are absolutely fragile, as you say. Um, the roading contractors, I think, when I last caught up, they had cleared about 15 slips today already, and um, but I think three or four more came down right behind them. So it's an ongoing battle, and with this incoming weather event, which we've now gone to red on, um, I don't think it's going to clear up, you know, probably maybe until next week. It's like whack-a-mole on the roads. Is any, are any parts of the Coromandel completely cut off? Uh, at the moment, uh, as we speak, no, but in 10 minutes' time, that could totally change. And that's why Waka Kotahi and us are saying, 
yeah, try and avoid the Coromandel if you can. It's, I mean, it's not good for businesses, but it's also dangerous. So at the moment, you can get along the eastern seaboard, so pretty much from Matarangi, Whangapoa, all the way down to Wangamata. If you want to leave the Coromandel, I think that road is still open at the moment. Um, but everywhere else, it's just... Um, yeah, it's very dangerous, and as I said, slips come down at a moment's notice, and they're going to continue for the, for the rest of the week at least. So in the nicest possible way, Gary, people that would normally be visiting you for a long weekend, you're simply saying, please don't. Thanks, but no thanks. Until the weekend, when we've uh, when with this latest weather event, as I said, we've gone to red on, so it's going to be pretty impactful. So let's get through that, and that's, um, that's going to go on Thursday. Maybe by the weekend, let's have another look at it. And if the sun comes out, by all means, come up and have a cafe. Hey, tell me, have you had any evacuations or people on standby to get out of their places? So there have been a couple of self-evacuations. So we don't necessarily hear about these until later on. But um, up in, uh, up on the Thames Coast Road, um, a slip did come down and impact a, um, one or two houses. And those people have just looked after themselves and gone to friends or relatives uh, while they sort things out. And this may have happened a couple of times in other places. Remember, we've got 30-odd little communities around the Coromandel, so a lot of them just um, shake themselves off and look after themselves. Advice for people to prepare for this next bout of weather? What should they be doing? The main reason we've gone to a red is the regional council have serious concern that the land stability right around the Coromandel um, could be compromised due to sheer, sheer saturation. So that is one of the main reasons. So that means that anybody who lives on, you know, lives on a hill or has got a hilly section or something needs to keep an eye on, you know, are there any cracks and those sort of things because there is evidence that that is starting to occur. So that's the main reason. On top of another 120 mils, which will put us close to 1.5 metres. So, uh, yeah, we're not getting out of it anytime soon. Good luck, Gary. Thanks for your time, as always. Gary Taylor there, who's the Thames Coromandel Civil Defence Controller. Auckland Zoo will be closed for at least the week after raging floodwaters up to a metre and a half high swept through the complex. A neighbouring creek breached its banks, forcing staff to move animals to higher ground. Zoo Director Kevin Bowley says there's a big clean-up ahead. It's our centenary year, and I'm still trying to decide whether it's apt or ironic uh, that we're dealing with the worst floods we've had in 100 years of our existence. So, uh, yeah, the lowest areas of the zoo, the ones adjacent to Motions Creek, have been hardest hit, um, and we've seen unprecedented levels of flooding there um, that's going to take some time to clear up um, with associated damage. But also other areas of the zoo, just with the sheer volume of water that's come through there. So our African African habitats are, are looking well rain scarred at the moment. Um, yeah. So for people who aren't that familiar with the zoo, Kevin, which animals are around that area where the creek is um, closest? So it's primarily our New Zealand species. That's where our New Zealand precinct is. But then there's also the alligators and other lizard species um, quite close to that creek. And on a, on a you know on a on a summer's day it's a nice babbling brook, um, but because that creek also takes a lot of storm water runoff from from quite a large catchment area outside the zoo, um, when the rains hit the levels rise very quickly. Um, now normally that they stay within the boundaries of the the stone wall, but on Friday afternoon, Friday evening, it became increasingly apparent that we were going to have the, those walls breached, um, and so the teams moved into action, moved those animals that were immediately adjacent um, to the creek to a to higher ground and to a safe place. So um, which animals did you actually have to pick up and take off to safety? Uh, so those familiar with the zoo will be um, know about lizard lane, um, so all the, all the specimen species down there. Some of the skinks um, in, in our New Zealand precinct had to be moved out of their areas where the water eventually got to about a metre and a half and more deep. Um, a so, metre and a half? Uh, honestly, I was looking at photographs of it and I was, it, I was struggling to tell what I was looking at. Um, so under normal circumstances, areas that would, would be sometimes two, three metres below the waterline um, were now a metre and a half deep in water. So you're looking about, you know, five metre rise in water levels through the zoo. So it's, it's not something the zoo can actively control. We're, we're entirely at the mercy of what comes down that creek at us. Um, and as I say, ordinarily, it's not an issue um, with, with regular stormwater. Did um, you 
did you manage, Kevin? I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you manage to keep all the animals safe? Yeah, well, unfortunately, we lost we lost two small birds um, in two different areas of the zoo. One in the vet centre and and one um, in one of our um, New Zealand precinct aviaries. And uh, it just appears that they were overwhelmed, as, as I, indeed I imagine thousands of uh, specimens of wildlife would have been in the wild by the, the unprecedented levels of rain. Well, um, that's apart, sad, isn't it? Uh, yeah, um, although I think without the prompt actions of the staff on, on, the, on site that were working to well beyond midnight on that Friday night, um, things would have been a hell of a lot worse. Um, so I'm incredibly proud and thankful for them you know, working throughout that evening and again now Saturday, Sunday, public holiday Monday, um, just trying to make things right. How are the rest of the animals coping? I mean, obviously they experience bad weather if they're out in the wild too, but this is pretty horrendous, more to come. Um, do they seem stressed? No, not really. I mean, they're, they're incredibly adaptable and of course, as always, they're receiving the best levels of care from our staff on site. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's normal practice for our teams when we're expecting bad weather to, to shut, shut species such as um, our lions and tigers into secure areas. Um, and, you know, when, when they all come out, I was watching the giraffes out this morning on the, on the battered paddock and, and they seem perfectly happy. As long as they've got their brows there to eat and, and, and food as normal, then they seem quite comfortable out there. Um, but uh, I can imagine that on fr- Friday night and Saturday, it, was, it would have been particularly stressful for them as it was for you know, domestic pets and, and people generally. It was not a normal weekend. And that was Kevin Bewley from Auckland Zoo. If you were listening to that, do check out our website. Those are some phenomenal photos of the water just absolutely roaring through the zoo there. As he said, they had to move some animals to higher ground. Um, You will have heard, perhaps, that schools in the Auckland area are staying closed until after the Waitangi weekend um, holiday. Well, have been advised to, anyway, by the Ministry of Education. But there's some confusion, and we're getting feedback about Auckland grammar. Um, Auckland Grammar has put out a notice to its parents and it reads in part I am aware of recent media reports stating the schools must close until Tuesday 7th of February. At this point on anniversary day the school has received no communication from the Ministry of Education that supports this. I have read the press release as no doubt you have that states schools in Kura can open or remain open for on-site instruction but need to provide distance learning. It goes on to say as communicated with you yesterday and today we have spent the weekend preparing our campus to be open tomorrow. As the Ministry of Education has not communicated with us today, the best I can do is read the media reports that provide an option for schools to remain open. Given this, we will continue with our plans to open for instruction from 9am tomorrow. That's a message that gone out to parents with um, students at Auckland Grammar from the headmaster there, Tim O'Connor, what well, seems to conflict with advice from the Ministry of Education. We will have Tim O'Connor on later in the programme to clarify the situation, so do stay tuned for that. Um, a lot of you coming in with feedback on insurance and the cost of it. This person says, got no insurance. The annual premium would cost me two weeks' wages. That's 80 hours of work. It's just too dear. It's a risk that I take, that person says. Another says, we do not have contents insurance because we... Um, cannot afford to. Our house is insured for replacement, third party on our cars. Insure the things that you cannot afford to replace, this person says. Our house insurance with AA went up 20% in January due to the earthquake levy, another listener says. Gone from 117 a month in 2019 to 153. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Ngā mihi o te pō. Good evening. I'm Evie Ashton. Aucklanders hit by devastating floods are bracing for more. A weather warning for the city north of Odewa has been upgraded to red, with up to 120 millimetres of rain expected to hit from late tomorrow afternoon. The rest of the city remains at orange, but the Mayor Wayne Brown says the ground is so saturated and the drains so full the storm could be more dangerous than Friday's disaster. He's urging businesses to stay closed tomorrow. The warning for Northland has also been lifted to red, with torrential rain expected from about four in the morning. Coromandel is also now red, the bad weather arriving late tomorrow night. 
Met Service meteorologist Luis Fernandez says saturated ground in the Upper North Island led to the heavy rain and wind warning being upgraded to red. Whenever we issue a red warning, we are really telling the public it is something to really take note of and to be prepared, especially if you are in a vulnerable area, if you're close to rivers or uh, if you're on the road or anything like that, you really should be aware that this is a significant um, situation. Luis Fernandez says a low pressure system lingering across northern parts of the country is causing the ongoing heavy rain. The system is also drawing down very moist air from the tropics. A South Auckland community leader describes Auckland Council's handling of the flood emergency as disgraceful. Dave Latelli has told Checkpoint that the lack of teamwork and leadership on the council meant many families were left to fend for themselves. He's called for Mayor Wayne Brown to resign. Mr Latelli says the emergency was an opportunity for the mayor to stand up, and he didn't. He says his team has been delivering food to hard-hit homes. And there was one home in particular, uh, one of our, our team come across and it, it looked abandoned, but, you know, he went in anyway, you know, just to see, because the garage was open and then he went in and it was a, a, a disabled man just um, on, on the floor, couldn't move and in pain and had just been laying there since, since it happened. Dave Latelli says while community support has been great, many families still need basic supplies. Wayne Brown has conceded that his and his officer's communication on Friday night wasn't good enough, but he says he has no plans to resign. At a media conference earlier today, Mr Brown said he was elected to fix Auckland and this is a giant fix-up, but he says there are lessons to be learned. I want to say to Auckland is that yes, there have been hiccups, of course. I accept that our communications, including mine and my office, were not good enough, especially on Friday night, and I am commissioning a full independent review of all the decisions and actions made by everybody taken in the first 24 to 48 hours, including mine and my office. Wayne Brown says the council will act on recommendations for improvements. 69 buildings have been red stickered and 300 yellow stickered so far in Auckland. Auckland Emergency Management says people are prohibited from entering red stickered buildings but can call their hotline if they need to retrieve items. Ian McCormick, the council's building consent manager, says inspections will ramp up from tomorrow, weather permitting. We are looking to put uh, 120 teams in the field. We're looking to aim for around about um, 700 to 1,000 assessments a day. We've also asked Envy uh, for some support and already a large number of uh, councils from around the country are providing us uh, trained rapid assessment uh, assessors. Ian McCormick says 720 white stickers have also been issued where assessors found no immediate problems with the building. Five Taudanga homes have been deemed unsafe to live in after a landslide swept through properties on Egret Avenue in Maungatapu. A safety assessment has been carried out in the area involving City Council building inspectors and geotechnical engineers. Other homes in the street have been assessed safe and residents are allowed to return home. The council says with more rain forecast this week, residents should check gutters, clear drains and check on friends, family and neighbours. Auckland principals are backing a decision to keep the region's schools closed for a week. Schools in Auckland were scheduled to start reopening from tomorrow but have been told to remain closed until February the 7th. Tertiary institutions and early childhood centres are also affected. Glenfield College principal Paul McKinley says the decision is the right one. I think it's an appropriate decision and, and prudent because we need a bit of clarity and surety for the community. A lot of families out there are suffering, whether it be housing or food. You know, also mixed messages of half of Auckland are open and half aren't, and, and people travel across Auckland. It have put uh, challenges on the infrastructure and the bus systems, etc. Paul McKinley says parts of his school were flooded on Friday and Saturday, but it could have reopened for teaching tomorrow. Auckland Transport says buses will replace trains between Newmarket and Britomart tomorrow after a further slip on the Western Line. The Dakino ferry service is still unable to run due to debris in the water and the Morningside underpass will remain closed due to flooding. And a missile fired from Russia has hit an apartment building in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, killing at least one person. Moscow is also targeting the southern city of Kherson in late-night strikes. The BBC's Sasha Schlichter has more. 
Local officials say multiple launch rocket systems, artillery, mortars and tank shells were used to target Kherson, the only regional capital to have fallen to the Russians before they beat a humiliating retreat in November. In this latest attack, three people were killed, six others were wounded, two of them when a hospital got hit. In his nightly address, President Zelensky said Russia had stepped up the intensity of its attacks in the east, trying to punch through Ukrainian defences around Bakhmut and Vukhledar, with no regard for casualties. And in news just to hand, Waka Kotahi says there's been a crash on the northbound lane of State Highway 2 between Petoni and Melling. The left lane is blocked following the crash at a quarter to six. That's the news. On our changing world this week, we join a school group learning about what it's like to be a marine biologist and find out about a widely abundant sea creature that you've probably never even considered. The sponges occupy anywhere between kind of 40 to maybe 70 or 80% of the available rock surface. They are, they are the, the most dominant thing there. Follow Our Changing World on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or iHeart or listen 7pm each Thursday on Nights with Karen Hay here on RNZ National. You're back with Lisa Owen on Checkpoint Next. Right now, the short forecast from Met Service to midnight Tuesday for Northland and Auckland. Periods of rain easing to isolated showers this afternoon. Periods of rain with heavy falls, possible thunderstorms and downpours returning to Northland tomorrow and to Auckland overnight Tuesday. From Waikato to Taranaki, including Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and the central high country, isolated showers turning to rain in the eastern areas tomorrow. Some heavy falls possible in Coromandel Peninsula tomorrow night. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mainly fine. Isolated showers in Gisborne tomorrow. From Whanganui to Wellington, also for Waidadapa, isolated showers, some heavy and possibly thundery in Taihape. Whanganui, Manawatu, Taradua this afternoon and evening, with the chance of localised downpours. Nelson Bola, Westland, Marlborough and Canterbury. Cloudy periods with scattered showers, some possibly heavy and thundery inland during the afternoon and evening. Low cloud about Canterbury coast for a time tomorrow. Fiordland, Otago and Southland mainly fine. Scattered afternoon and evening showers, some heavy and possibly thundery tomorrow. And for De Kohu, the Chatham Islands, mainly fine. The time is eight minutes past six. I'll have news headlines for you at 6.30. Nā mihi e ho, no mai hoki mai, this is Checkpoint, ko Lisa Owen tēnē. Welcome to this extended Checkpoint as we bring you the latest on the weather across the North Island. We'll be with you until 7 o'clock this evening. And if you are just joining us, the Met Service and Civil Defence warn of more intense rain in the next 48 hours. A rainfall warning has been upgraded to red for parts of Auckland, Coromandel and Northland from tomorrow afternoon. It comes as the region recorded almost eight times its usual January rainfall. The Ministry of Education has instructed all schools, early childhood centres and tertiary institutions to close until February 7th. Now Auckland Grammar School Principal Tim O'Connor says his school will remain open and he'll join us shortly. We'll also have the latest from two political polls. TVNZ's Kantar poll shows Labour narrowly overtaking National. Chris Hipkins is also ahead of National Leader Chris Luxon as preferred Prime Minister. And we'll have the latest on that from our deputy political editor, Craig McCulloch, a little later in the programme. Meanwhile, 69 homes have been red-stickered, meaning they are inaccessible. 300 more have been yellow-stickered. That means limited access. Residents in the suburbs of Titarangi and Henderson Valley remain the most badly affected with power outages and some have had no running water since Saturday. The message to motorists in Auckland is still don't travel if you don't have to. Andrew Allen is in charge of all the roads in the Auckland network and he joins us now. Kia ora, Andrew. Kia ora. There is another slip. What can you tell us about this latest one? Um, well, the latest slip is an additional slip on one of our rail lines that's affecting the western line um, and that will mean that we've made to make a change. The western line will continue to run services tomorrow um, but we will need to replace trains with buses between Newmarket and Britomot. OK, well, talk us through the other disruptions as well. All right, well, look, the, 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 the network is still continuing to experience, as you've just said, severe weather, and we're continuing to see impact. It's an ever-changing situation because more slips are coming down uh, and under scour to our roads is still occurring. But, but in essence, we're working quite hard on the roading network. We've got crews working 24-7, basically around the clock, 
trying to restore um, access through all of our roading network. We're in quite a good position. Um, we're sitting at a situation right now where we have road closures, either full or partial, uh, across uh, in the order of 30 roads. And I say in the order because because that is changing on the hour. Uh, for the latest update in terms of uh, roads that are closed versus those that have been opened, uh, the best thing to do is to just visit our website and there is a full list that's being updated on a regular basis there. Um, when it comes to, tra- to um, public transport services, that's pretty good news. I've just commented on the train situation. All of our lines will be running tomorrow, although uh, there will be disruptions, and in some places, buses replace trains. Uh, ferries are running on time, should be running on time tomorrow. Uh, the only ferry that's significantly impacted is our Rakino ferry service, which is still unable to run on the inner harbour because uh, of debris in the water. And um, I think the other thing that's important to note, the Morningside underpass will remain closed uh, due to flooding that we're experiencing there. But look, if you're catching public transport, the, the news is to plan your trip well in advance. All of our services, all of our services will be impacted with the continuing weather situation. Um, so plan ahead. Uh, allow extra time for your journey. Please allow extra time for your journey. And keep an eye on the changing weather position. So if you if you go in in the morning, wherever you're travelling to, make sure you've got an eye on what's happening later in the day to make sure you can make your return journey home in good time. Uh, and that Andrew, would be my advice. Uh, Andrew, is the Harbour Bridge still at risk of closure? Uh, yes, the Harbour Bridge is still at risk of closure. We have an amber wind warning in place for tomorrow. Uh, an amber wind warning does mean that if winds get up to uh, a threshold that we will need to either put speed restrictions on the bridge or even in, in extreme, more extreme cases have to close the harbour bridge. OK, well, this raises the question, doesn't it? You know, because some people will be coming back from holidays. They anticipated their kids would be going back to school and a lot of people will be going into work. Do you actually want people driving around the city, coming into the CBD, given the number of roads that are compromised? Are, are you asking them, best case scenario, could they work at home? What is the instruction? Yes, look, I think that's the sensible um, instruction or, or, or direction rather than instruction. The, the, as, I've, as I've said, the road network is open. By and large, we have restored a lot of access across the network, although that's not full. So many, many traffic management plans in place, and we're down to limited lanes. So while roads may be open, uh, a good example would be Great North Road, which has only got two lanes, so it's down to half of its capacity. So that will mean significant delays to journey times. So the sensible thing really is just to think about your travel. If you don't need to travel, then the advice is don't travel. If you do, the network's open, plan your trip before you go and allow plenty of time just in case there are delays on your journey. Thank you for the update, Andrew. That's Andrew Allen from Auckland Transport there. As he says, keep an eye on the roads. It's a moving feast. And there is also much confusion tonight at one Auckland secondary school after the Ministry of Education instructed all Auckland schools, early childhood centres and tertiary institutions to close until February 7 due to more expected bad weather. But Auckland Grammar Headmaster Tim O'Connor has emailed parents tonight to say his school will remain open tomorrow. And Tim O'Connor joins me now. Hi, Tim. Why are you opening up? Good evening, Lisa. Um, the information we've had, um, we received via the media, and I did explain that to the Ministry this evening. And there is a line in their media release that says schools in Kura can open or remain open for on-site instruction, um, but need to provide distance learning. Um, I've uh, written to the Ministry, or well, I've wrote to our parents because we have... Uh, 60 boys in the hostel because we started teaching last week. I've got another 60 on their way back into Auckland. So I did need to make a call given the information that we were receiving on a second-hand basis and so informed our parents that it was still our decision to remain open uh, unless we were directed um, to close. Uh, I've since uh, contacted both the Director of Education for Auckland and the Deputy Secretary the region uh, and copy them in our comms uh, and both have noted those. So at this point, uh, we haven't been told to, that it is a directive to close. Uh, if it is, if we are given a directive, then of course we would follow a directive. But our choice is to give boys normality um, as much as we possibly can. A couple of things there, Tim. Are you, are you criticising the level of communication from the Ministry of Education around this? 
I didn't receive any communication from the Ministry of Education, That's my so point. I can't you've... really criticise it. <laughs> so what do you think of the comms you've had then? Well, it took me to actually contact the Secretary General, um, then uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary, to actually find out. So um, I don't think that's a great way um, for anyone to be communicating or for schools to find out secondhand via the media. So is it a captain's call from the Ministry then? Uh, we'll wait and find out, I guess. Um, I've but- communicated again to seek clarity um, after the Deputy Secretary has communicated to say our decision was noted um, uh, and I want to seek get absolute clarity that um, it is in the directive uh, because, of course, we want to follow the law. OK. You've got, what, 2,500 students, is it, round about? Yeah. Is it a good idea to have all of those young people travelling around tomorrow, getting to school, given the state of the roads, given the concern about more heavy rain, and you're right in Epsom, which was particularly badly hit? Well, the red weather warning is from 6pm tomorrow night north of O'Reeva. Um, There is nothing that is suggesting um, that anything is going to happen in the central city. Uh, the Mayor's suggestion was that schools should close for one day. The Ministry have appeared to made a unilateral decision that schools should close for a week. It doesn't seem to have much logic to it. So, Tim, do you think you're better informed than the officials who have made this call? No, what I'm telling you is with the information we have is there is still an option to remain open. Um, so we've just simply chosen that option. I think I, well, I hope I've made it clear that if we were told that it was a directive um, for other reasons, then we, of course we would honour that. So Tim, if some students stay away or their parents keep them home, will you, will you count that as an, un, an unaccounted for absence or do you accept that they are um, following the instructions, the instructions of the Ministry of Education? No, we've informed parents that if their personal circumstances are such that they can't transport their sons to school safely tomorrow, then he should stay at home. And we would provide distance learning uh, via Graminet for them, and they just simply need to inform us via the parent portal. Thank you for clarifying that. That is Tim O'Connor, who is Auckland Grammar's headmaster there. 17 minutes after six, and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National, and we are with you until seven o'clock this evening. Meanwhile, two major political polls have just dropped, and new Labour leader Chris Hipkins has turned around his party's fortunes, with Labour overtaking National in both polls. In the One News Kantar public poll, Labour is up five points to 38%. National is down a point to 37%. Act is also down a point to 10%. The Greens have also fallen down 2% to 7%. And New Zealand First is down 2 points to 2%. And Te Pāti Māori is down a point to 1%. Chris Hipkins is ahead in the preferred Prime Minister stakes at 23%, while Christopher Luxon is just behind him at 22%. And the News Hub Read Research poll shows the same. Labour has bounced five, bounced 5.7 points to 38%. National is down 4.1 points to 36.6%. And ACT is at 10.7%. Greens are at 8.1%. New Prime Minister Chris Hipkins is slightly ahead of Christopher Luxon in those preferred Prime Minister ratings on 19.6% and 18.8% respectively. Hell of a lot of numbers there. So... Next, our political de- our deputy political editor Craig McCulloch joins us now. Break it down for us, Craig. What does this all mean? Oh, yes, there certainly are a lot of numbers. Chris Hipkins has not had a long time in this job, so this is very much a first impression, and what an impression. Commentators had been split as to what sort of effect the change um, from Jacinda Ardern to Chris Hipkins would have. Would it help the Labour Party, or would it hinder it? Now, we have not just one poll, but two polls out today to answer that question, and they show a five-point bump for the Labour Party. Jacinda Ardern had become an increasingly polarising figure, an increasingly divisive figure at the end of last year. The red wave of 2020 had well and truly retreated. And this shows now just how much of that was tied to her 
personally and her leadership. The, re the, the results really do challenge that conventional wisdom of last year, which was that although it was Jacinda Ardern was becoming more divisive, uh, she, she was still the party's best asset, the, the, their um, greatest chance of electoral victory. That does not appear to have been the case. Chris Hipkins has turned around the trend for Labour, which has been down for some time. The party perhaps also rewarded for the, the transition, a seamless transition from Jacinda Ardern to Chris Hipkins. Um, you know, changes in leaderships can sometimes be very fraught. It was not the way in this case, and Chris Hipkins and Labour will be very encouraged by this first result. He hasn't even been in the job a week though, Craig. Is this just a honeymoon bounce? Well, it is week one for Chris Hipkins, that is true. It is still very early days, and this poll will act as a bit of a benchmark. They will be very interested in the months, and the, well, in the weeks and the months ahead, um, and the polls that come down the line. Uh, one of these polls um, ran from, the TVNZ poll ran from Wednesday through to Sunday. The other one ran from uh, Sunday to Friday. So you're right, very early days, a a and um, the public still have a, a little bit more time to make up their mind. One of the things though to watch out for, you talked about the preferred Prime Minister numbers early on, Labour will be incredibly happy with the fact that Chris Hipkins is still ahead of Christopher Luxon here. Until now, Chris Hipkins has been a non-entity when it comes to the preferred Prime Minister. He hasn't even registered effectively and, and you wouldn't have expected him to be because he wasn't in the running. The dynamics have now shifted. We're talking about Chris Hipkins versus Christopher Luxon. That's a very different showdown between Christopher Luxon and Jacinda Ardern. Um, that TVNZ approval rating, 36, ahead of what Weir Ardern was, um, ahead of uh, Luxon currently. And on News Hub, they asked people, who do you trust? And more people trust Chris Hipkins than trust Christopher Luxon. That is a very important figure to watch as well. These numbers are important in a head-to-head -head battle, and that looks like what we're heading into. OK, we shouldn't call them the minor parties anymore, I don't think, but the coalition, potential coalition partners, who are the winners and losers there? Well, one of the underreported stories of this term has been the strength of those minor parties, particularly the Greens and ACT. They have held up, bouncing around that 10% mark right through, and they're still similarly around that area. Um, we're seeing the Greens at 8 and 7, respectively, um, ACT around that 10% mark. Uh, the, the numbers have fallen away slightly um, from all these other parties, and that's why we've seen the lift for Labour. However, um, it does bring those other parties, particularly the Māori Party, back into play. They could become a crucial factor uh, in picking an election, but just because the, the numbers have become a whole lot tighter. If you look at um, News Hub, you see that it comes down to uh, the Māori Party as the, the deciders, as the kingmakers, as it were. Whether they were to go with National or Labour, you'd think it'd be more likely that they go with Labour, but this, this election year so far has been incredibly unpredictable. And then in TVNZ, you could be looking at a hung parliament um, because National and Act, they can only get to 60 seats. Um, well, uh, Labour and the Greens are only on 58. With the two from Māori Party, that's not enough. So we're looking at a, an incredibly tight face-off between these two, two blocks, the left and the right. Thanks for the translation, Craig. That's our Deputy Political Editor, Craig McCulloch, there. A South Auckland family has been left with nothing after fleeing for their lives on Friday night. Fear, panic and anger gripped the residents of Mangari while a wall of water ro roared through the streets. Children and elderly were left to brave the torrents to get to safety after their homes rapidly flooded. Jonty Dine reports. With her three young grandchildren, aged one, three and five in the house, Taina Tutai feared for their lives as water breached their home. I just don't know what to do. I was helpless. They're crying and I said, it's all right, so what? we'll be all right, we'll be all right. But they keep singing, my God loves me. That's the thing that hurt me the most. They're crying, singing, my God loves me. Miss Tutai says it was terrifying. It's just like a river. It's streaming down the street, our street, right through everybody's house. Fortunately, her niece came to the rescue. She came to the rescue, took all the children out through this water. I was so deep. She's our hero. I call her, she's our hero. They save our children, our grandchildren. With the children out of harm's way, it was now for Mrs Tutai and her ailing partner to wade through the Nikai deluge. Whatever we got on us, we just walked through. No shoes. No, nothing at all. She describes a completely chaotic scene outside. And then we had, I had to pull him back. We hold on the fence. That's where how we get to there, to hold on uh, the fence. The next minute, the fence just came off. 
And then we grab, we grab another one and we saw another two ladies be swept, be swept down by the, the water. And this guy was chasing after the two ladies. It took her and her partner over an hour to make the short walk around the corner to her niece's house. The current is so strong, very strong. It was an excruciating wait for a mokopona. I walked in the house and I saw all my grandchildren. I was happy. I was so happy to see all my grandchildren. But almost nothing can be salvaged from her home. Everything. I've lost everything. The council came yesterday. Can't do anything. So told us to, to get out of the house. We can't stay in here. She says she has been left traumatised. Honestly, I don't know. It will take a while. Because I, I can't sleep at night. I'm still thinking what's happened that night. Whanga Polipoli says the flood struck suddenly. Everybody was um, I don't know, rushing outside and um, starting screaming. We didn't even see it coming. We just heard people screaming outside and then we just opened the door and it's right in our doorstep. The distressing reality then set in. You can see uh, people walking out. The water was right up to here. Past their waist? Yeah, and uh, they were carrying the kids overhead. After seeking refuge at his sister's, the Fano could only imagine what was happening to their home. So we just managed to uh, just sit uh, anywhere in the sitting room and uh, uh, talk, talk, talk. We didn't sleep. <laughs> we didn't sleep all night. Compounding the crisis, the water was also filled with human waste. They tested the flooded the water and they said it was the sewage that mixed up with the sewage. Oh. The, the sewage overflow and then uh, so everything that the water touched, she she said, it's, it's no good. It was so brown. With everything inside his house contaminated, Mr Pulley Pulley says it's going to be a long and costly recovery. Might be uh, close to 50 grand. Paulina Kylo has physical limitations due to surgery and could only watch the horror unfold. I just stand at the window looking up because I couldn't do anything, you know, I'm sick, I might go out there and then I end up in the hospital. She says they were given no warning at all. We got no time to grab everything. We tried to put something on the table. Then we run upstairs, next minute the water's climbing up. Miss Tutai says she is angry that they were essentially abandoned. There was no help on the night for everybody here. There's no, no help. They had to put the old man on the airbed. There's no rescues. There's no one. Residents whose homes survived Friday's flood say they are on edge with more wet weather scheduled to hit the region this week. John T. Dine reporting there. A major business group says they've been blindsided by the decision to keep schools closed for another week. Employers and Manufacturers Association CEO Brett O'Reilly joins me now. Um, Brett, what's the matter with that decision regarding the schools? Well, I think it's been made without a lot of thought um, about the impact um, on businesses. I mean, the um, ironically, we found out about it while we were holding... Um, one of our Auckland Business Roundtable meetings with all of the associations present. And uh, and our concern is that um, right at the time when we need to have as many people um, working on the recovery, um, we've got, we're going to have a lot of families and communities impacted by um, by schools and, uh, and other education facilities not being open. And um, certainly from the, the discussions that we'd had with, um, with schools, we understood that many of them were ready to open. We understand, of course, some have been impacted by this, but uh, this feels like a de facto lockdown for Auckland um, right at a time when we need people, uh, people working on that, uh, on that recovery. Uh, and very disappointed that um, that there was um, there was no discussion with the business community before this decision was taken. So, what are you saying that some workers won't be able to come and do essential service work because they've got kids to look after? Absol- absolutely, um, and 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 some businesses uh, that would have normally expected staff to be at um, at work tomorrow will now be impacted because those staff will be. Um, uh, will have to stay home and uh, and be caregivers for um, uh, for their families, which is obviously very important. So for businesses that were already um, impacted by the weather events, um, the, you know, literally we were on on this call and and we're getting emails and text messages from members and people saying, "What do we do? What what's the what's the position here? Um, how does this impact annual leave?" Um, you know, uh, if people can't can't come to work, and uh, you know, nothing on the major government sites around um, how this is being dealt with, uh, but seemingly a decision made by the Secretary of Education uh, 
Okay, so um, you've called it your words, de facto lockdown. So yeah. when that was announced, how would you describe the um, the feeling in that meeting? Oh, I think it was, um, it, you know, people people were concerned um, about the impact that the, you know this is going to have on their businesses. You know? Angry, Brett? Would you describe them as angry? Um, angry, bemused, frustrated. Um, when we have, um, when uh, and you know, all of all of um, these groups have been working hard to support businesses over um, the last few days, and to find a decision of this magnitude made without much thought about just how it will impact um, uh, businesses is um, is pretty surprising, to be honest. It's a safety issue, though, isn't it? And if they've said they, you know, need to keep people off the roads because all of that um, roading infrastructure is compromised, there is a severe weather warning, and they don't want young people wandering around and potentially um, parents going back and forth to pick them up in terrible weather. It's a safety issue, isn't it? Doesn't that come oh, oh, first? Look, look, Lisa, if it is a safety issue, um, then that's um, uh, that's fine. But but to have are we suggesting that people aren't going to go to work because of the conditions of the road? Are we suggesting that we're closing down um, uh, transport companies from delivering essential products? I mean, just what just what is going on here? Um, I've talked to the Mayor, um, Wayne Brown, in the last few minutes. He said that it was certainly not council's suggestion that businesses don't um, go to work. Um, he said his... Um, his the you know definitive position is that it's up to businesses to decide, um, but now we have some of that decision taken out of business ha- businesses' hands by the Secretary of Education. At the very least, I would have expected that there would have been some discussion about this before a decision of this magnitude was made, um, and uh, and why through to the seventh of February. I Brent, mean, uh, on a related issue, you have expressed some concerns about the huge recovery and re- rebuild effort. What, what's your main issue and worry there? Um, our main main worry is that um, w- we won't have enough people available to to get um, uh, to get businesses up and going. Um, and now some of the people that would have been involved in that process uh, are going to have to stay home tomorrow. Um, our understanding, but that it's limited because we haven't been involved in, in the discussions, is that the severe weather is due to hit Auckland tomorrow night. Um, so, but now we have a whole uh, a, a number of workers that will not be able to to, um, to turn up to work tomorrow because they're having to do the essential job of looking after their families. We understand that, but um, without with with that thought having not gone in about the impacts. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty frustrating. Longer term, you are worried about whether we have enough labour and specialist labour to do the repairs and the rebuild in Auckland that is required. So what are you suggesting? Where should we get these people from? Well, I, I think we're going to have to look at um, from around New Zealand and potentially from Australia. They are the most immediate um, issues. Uh, of major concern from our meeting tonight is the number of businesses that do not have insurance. Um, it appears that um, during, um, you know, with the the after effects of COVID on on many businesses, um, as I've been trying to reduce costs, they haven't uh, got insurance, um, and so uh, and that's that's very prevalent across uh, small businesses. And, and we, from the initial survey results that a number of the organisations involved in the roundtable have done. Uh, th- this is uh, this is going to be a very long uh, long process. So we'll be working closely with the insurance companies and the banks. But for those for those businesses that don't have insurance, this might be the last straw. Brett, really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. That's Brett O'Reilly, who's the CEO of the Employers and Manufacturers Association there. They're saying they're blindsided by this decision to encourage schools to stay closed until next week. It is 26 minutes to seven. And homai or Fakaro, we would love your feedback. Oh, let us know what your thoughts are on the school closures. If you're a business, how does it affect you? Do you think it's a fair call? 2101 on text, or you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. And this is a Checkpoint weather special, so we're going to be with you until 7pm this evening. So do get in touch and join the conversation. It is time now to go to the headlines, though. Ko evi ano 
Mat Service has issued a series of orange and red weather warnings for heavy rain, high winds and possible thunderstorms for much of the upper North Island tomorrow. Auckland Mayor Wayne Brown is urging businesses to stay closed. The new Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, has helped give Labour a bump in the latest One News Kantar public poll. Labour has risen five points to 38, while National is on 37%, down one. Waka Kotahi says a crash has closed both northbound lanes on State Highway 2 between Petone and Melling. And the former British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, says Vladimir Putin threatened him with a missile strike in a phone call before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Those are the headlines. Our next news and weather is at 7. On June 17, 1843, a posse of European settlers head to the Wairo Valley, planning to arrest the powerful Ngāti Toa chief, Te Rauparaha. It all turns to disaster. A gun battle breaks out, 26 people are killed, including several Pākehā prisoners executed in the aftermath. So, what happened and why? To find out, check out New Zealand Wars, Stories of Wairo. From 7 o'clock on Sunday morning on RNZ National. Thanks for being with us for this Checkpoint special. We will be on air until 7 o'clock this evening. The roads in and around the Coromandel are increasingly fragile after a pounding of heavy rain. More to come. Some roads have now reopened, but a large section of State Highway 25A between Kōpū and Hikawai have been washed away. And as Crystal Gibbons reports, for many, their woes are far from over. It was supposed to be a busy time for Tairua, with many Aucklanders descending over anniversary weekend, but days of rain instead left the region cut off. For manager of the local campgrounds, Charlie Sapansky, the phone has been ringing off the hook with cancellations. 100% cancellations just about. We've had a few stragglers that have been in town that have had to, they couldn't get out of town, so we've, um, we've hailed them in here more or less. And then once the road has opened up, We've had one person come in today from Howlock, Auckland. With more rain forecasts later this week, manager at the Anchor Lodge in Coromandel Town, Sue Gildevero, says it remains to be seen if this Waitangi weekend will be prosperous. With these long weekends, of course, this is where we have the Coromandel absolutely buzzing and and we look around and it's just an empty, an empty place. I mean, you think it's the middle of July. Some roads in the region have reopened, allowing trapped visitors to leave and new ones to arrive. But Sue Gil Devereaux says State Highway 25A being washed away between Hikawai and Kopu will have a huge impact on the town. That's the gateway to the Coromandel from the Waikato and all the rest of it. Charlie Sapansky says with only two arterial routes left, being cut off again is a real concern for residents. They've got to put all the heavy trucks going Waihi Wangamata Road and if the infrastructure doesn't hold up to all those big trucks, you know, 20 tonne, 40 tonne trucks coming around, that road's going to fall apart and then we will definitely be isolated. Josie Fraser from Umu Cafe says alternative options are also limited. Our only way out really in that kind of um, situation is to get the helicopter to come over uh, and so, uh, yeah, it definitely is um, an issue. Uh, we used to have ferry service, and unfortunately Phil has pulled that this summer. Um, that would have been an alternate route for people to get out. With the tourist hotspot also dependent on seasonal income, being cut off would make a bad season a lot worse. The long list of roads that have been damaged in the flooding are creating a few headaches for those relying on the network. The National Road Carriers Association CEO is Justin Tai Umbers and he joins us now. Tell us, Justin, what is the impact of this? A lot of roads with damage, some closed temporarily, others, well, maybe for a lot, lot longer. Yeah, hi Lisa. Look, it's been um, unbelievable just how quickly um, we lost major chunks of the roading network around the region, um, particularly on Friday night. So, Obviously, this is huge impacts to those um, keeping our freight and supply chain open on the roads. Um, our truck drivers have just been, and uh, trucking firms at dispatch have to react at a moment's notice uh, when detours get put in place. So for drivers out there on the roads, um, that can mean having to do um, major detours, you know, 20 or 30 kilometres. Um, that can see them run out of hours. Uh, they need more fuel. Um, and then they may even need to go into smaller trucks if um, if some of the roads are unable to handle larger trucks, as we just heard. 
So that's a lot of juggling. What does that mean in, in terms of how much things cost? Yeah, look, ultimately all of that does flow through into the cost of goods, which, um, you know, is, is obviously the last thing we need for consumers and with inflation. But we're hearing from our members um, at National Road Carriers that insurance is, is getting increasingly expensive and just um, with the damage on the roads, that causes damage on the trucks. Um, from time to time it's getting worse and worse and that gets really expensive and also takes a truck off the road um, and means that the uh, the truck driver can't continue to earn while he's waiting for it to be repaired or while they're waiting for it to be repaired. So, um, yeah, ultimately it's, it's no good for our cost of goods out there. Are goods getting through? I know Coromandel in particular has had some really um, serious road damage. Are uh, trucks able to get through? Yeah, look, um, amazingly, we don't have any major settlements that have been cut off. So the freight um, and supply chain is still working. So they're having to be detours and sometimes detours on detours. Um, but the goods are getting through. So it's really important that your listeners um, don't go out and panic buy. There is there is no need for that. The, um, the drivers, um, the NZTA journey managers and the roading contractors are doing a phenomenal job. Um, to keep these road, roads open, but some of them are actually, you know, particularly in Coromandel, as we're hearing, you're down to one road in, one road out. So that's your last point of resilience. Um, and if they go um, with the weather that's coming, uh, then then we could be in trouble for some areas. Yeah, and saying that, Justin, what does it then tell us about the resilience of our infrastructure? <laughs> Well, look, you, you and I were just talking uh, earlier this week on Tuesday where I was calling for the need of um, for a 50-year strategic roading infrastructure plan. And look, when you look at the last six months, we've had the floods in East Coast, um, Nelson and Melbourne. We've had Northland and now Auckland. We just don't need any more wake-up calls as to why we need a 50-year roading infrastructure plan locked in. Um, we just need network resilience built in so we don't get communities um, cut off. And we need to keep up with our, our roading maintenance um, and not just sweat the asset and let it um, deteriorate over time because now we're really getting caught out. And catching up is going to be even harder because we need good weather um, to go out and work on the roads, and that's in short supply. Um, and, and as you've heard earlier in your um, program, Harbour Bridge might be closed tomorrow if the wind picks up. So we really need to start getting serious and disciplined about how we plan our roading infrastructure just as we do our electricity infrastructure. Justin, I know you're calling on the new Prime Minister to make roading a, a top priority, right? And and you've talked about um, a lack of resilience in our roading network. In saying that, though, were you shocked or surprised at the level of kind of chaos one storm has inflicted on us? Uh, look, I think we're all shocked to be honest, that, that volume of water was just unbelievable that we saw here and in, in, in the record, you know, three or four times the amount of rain that we, we normally have in that period. Um, absolutely, that's a huge shock. But also, I think when you just see how vulnerable our roads become, I mean, looking at that, that footage on 25A with, with huge chunks of the road just disappearing down the hillside, um, that is going to take months to repair. So, yeah, absolutely shocked. Thank you for your time, Justin. That's Justin Tai Umbers, who's the CEO of the National Road Carriers Association. Meanwhile, Auckland's Mayor Wayne Brown has conceded that the communication from him and from his office was not good enough on Friday night, but he has no plans to resign. Mr Brown told media he was elected to fix Auckland, and this is a giant fix up. But Mr Brown accepts communications were not good enough, and he has commissioned a full investigation. Well, I don't think I personally did anything wrong, but I actually followed um, the instructions closely and it may well be that one of the things we're going to review is whether or not all those instructions were as clear as they might have been as well. The, everyone's going to be reviewed here. Myself, the, the um, performance of the organisation, and it, you, it needs to be kept in mind, this is an unprecedented in scale. He says there are lessons to be learned. And the inquiry will look into all aspects, all people, and myself included, plus the professionals, plus even the government's in involvement and response. Everybody will look into this. Lessons must be learned. Mr Brown has asked the Defence Minister to prepare to bring in the army to help with sandbagging. It is almost a quarter to six. Kia mai, stay with us. You're listening to a Checkpoint special on RNZ National.
A man's been arrested for allegedly looting a flood damage store in the hard-hit Waido Valley on Auckland's North Shore. A 57-year-old man is facing burglary charges after products were taken from the vape store. Superintendent Shannon Gray says the police have stepped up patrols. It's really disappointing to see that some people um, take advantage in at times like this, um, and that's why police are really encouraging uh, people to keep a, an eye out for their neighbours, keep an eye out for their family. You know, if you've got someone who has had, had to move out of an address next door to you, uh, it's really important that you keep an eye on that and let us know if you see any suspicious behaviour. It's pretty low stuff, though, isn't it? It's really disappointing. Um, it was good that police were able to respond to uh, that incident overnight in Warrell Valley so quickly uh, and apprehend someone for burglary. So um, you know, we have uh, additional uh, resources out uh, in a reassurance patrol type capacity. So you know, we are, are spending a lot of time in those hard hit uh, suburbs across Tamaki Makoto where we are you know, providing that additional um, reassurance to our, our communities. What kind of store was this and, and what, what's happened? Uh, so there were two commercial premises on uh, Wairau Valley where someone has uh, taken the opportunity to move between the two premises. We had uh, reassurance patrols in the area and uh, the owner of one of the properties actually uh, was watching uh, this person via their CCTV footage. So it meant that we could respond really quickly uh, and apprehend the offender in the act. So are there some properties, just by the nature of the event, the severe flooding, that are unable to be secure, locked up property as, as they normally would be? Well, that's, that is unfortunately what comes about um, with incidents like this, is that uh, you know, some security measures uh, aren't as, as um, robust as they previously have been. Um, obviously, that's something that you know, people will continue to work on, and that's why police are encouraging uh, you know, the, those that are left in the community to keep an eye on some of those um, vulnerable premises. So what would your advice be to people who are nervous about leaving their homes or their businesses because they have to at the moment? Yeah, I suppose it's a case of if you do have some valuables that uh, you're able to take with you. Um, you know, on the on the night, uh, over the last 22 hours, obviously some people have had to leave their premises uh, very quickly uh, and have uh, left some bon- um, valuables in their uh, homes or buildings. Um, obviously, if they do have uh, the time to remove um, some of those more precious items that um, you know that would be encouraged. However, you know uh, we have those additional reassurance patrols out in the community, uh, and if you see anything suspicious, uh, please call one 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 immediately. Let us know. Uh, unfortunately, if you have been the victim of a crime and that's already occurred, uh, call ten five, which is our um, crime reporting line. Yeah. So, so how many more officers have you got out there doing this kind of work? So it's a case of actually re- uh, using the staff that we have rostered on. So the weekend that was planned across Tamaki Makoto, we had a whole lot of events, the Elton John concert, a number of festivals in the parks, etc. Um, obviously those have been cancelled and what we've done is we've used the staff that were assigned to those types of events and redeployed them into reassurance across Tamaki Makoto. Is it more widespread, the, this problem, than, than the incident where you've arrested someone? Have there been other incidents? Uh, as of 12 o'clock today, the reporting I've seen is it's only a, a small handful of reports through the police of, um, of what we call burglaries uh, to residential properties and burglaries to commercial properties uh, as a result of um, the weather event. So, um, you know, burglaries unfortunately aren't uncommon in our community and we're not seeing a, a huge influx as a result of this. Um, but obviously people are a little bit more on edge, uh, you know, having to leave their property. But again, you know, police are out there doing their best to provide the level of reassurance uh, it's, um, as best we can. And that's Superintendent Shannon Gray. To other news now, and well, let's go to the US. And an entire specialised police unit in the US city of Memphis has been disbanded after videos of officers viciously beating 29-year-old Tyree Nichols earlier this month were publicly released. The so-called Scorpion Special Unit is a 50-person team tasked with reducing crime. CNN's Boris Sanchez has the story. And a warning, the content of this report may be distressing. Damn, I didn't do anything! Police body camera footage shows that officers first encountered Tyree Nichols at this intersection in Memphis. It was about 8.24 p.m. on January 7th 
when they pulled him over. He stopped his car in the middle of that left turning lane and almost immediately officers withdrew their weapons and they rushed his car demanding that he get out. In seconds, they ripped him from the vehicle. Tyree was on the ground struggling. They deployed pepper spray. He was demanding an explanation, trying to figure out why they stopped him to begin with. A struggle ensued. He finally wound up on his feet and he took off heading in that direction. Officers discharge a taser at the 29-year-old, but apparently it misses. They begin to chase him as other officers are called to the scene. Young male black, slim build, blue jeans, and a hoodie. Okay. Right. Southbound Ross, where we last saw him. The body camera footage picks up about a quarter mile away and eight minutes later at this intersection. It shows two officers on top of Tyree beating him and pepper spraying him all as he calls out for his mother. Over the next five minutes, that mounted police surveillance camera shows what unfolded here, officers bludgeoning him with punches and kicks and a nightstick. Much of the blows coming with Tyree not posing any apparent threat. Eventually, it's here at this intersection that they drag his body and slump him over onto a police vehicle. All of this unfolding only about 80 yards from his mother's front door. You might get sprayed again. Hey, 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 then officers are seen fist bumping and heard speculating whether he was on drugs while Tyree Nichols is slumped over and bleeding. Hey, sit up, bro. Uh, sit up, man. And, uh, here you go, At 8.41 p.m., two medical personnel arrive on the scene. They've been placed on leave as their response to the incident is investigated. It isn't until 9.02 p.m., 21 minutes later, that an ambulance finally pulls into view of the camera, rushing Tyree Nichols to the hospital, where three days later, he dies. Over the past few years, parts of Australia have battled greater drought, floods and fires. In other words, swings of extreme weather that one expert calls climate whiplash. And Indigenous rangers across northern Australia are getting increasingly worried about the effects it's having. The ABC's Jane Barden has this report. In Arnhem Land, in the NT's tropical north, Wadakan Indigenous Rangerist Director Rosemary Nubblewad says she's worried the climate is seesawing between droughts and floods she's not used to. The river, it's been like flooding and getting drying up and also we've been getting pretty hot. Everything has changed now of this weather. Like it's time for green plum to fall down so we can collapse. But the storm, it just keeps on coming and coming. In the Red Desert at Uluru, Alanu Parks Australia ranger Shaley Swan is also seeing more damage from both severe heat and floods. Now we've got hotter months of the year where we get higher risks of wildfires burning hotter. Also those times of the year, it's higher rains where we get more erosion happening within the landscape and um, longer periods of drought. But unfortunately, even a lot of the plants are, are not being able to get through some of these longer droughts. CSIRO climate projection scientist Michael Gross says climate change will drive more of these pivots from one extreme to another. People in Australia felt a bit of whiplash between droughts and fires and then pretty quickly going into floods. And this increase in different types of extremes has been termed by some climate whiplash. So going from one extreme to a different type of extreme without a lot of break in between. That's going to be more and more of a concern. He says Australia has warmed slightly more more than 1.47 degrees so far and emissions reductions worldwide caused by COVID era travel restrictions have now been eclipsed. The warming targets are very much on track to reach that 1.5 degree limit specified by the Paris Agreement by about the mid 2030s uh, and Australia is warming a little bit faster.
faster than that global average. Have the actual emissions started to reduce a little bit? We did see a dip through COVID. However, we're still very much heading for much more than two degrees of global warming, which is, is a big concern. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Modelling forecasts that the difference between impacts from 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming include losing either 8 or 16 per cent of plant species, losing 1.5 million or 3 million tonnes of global fish catches and losing either 70 or 99 per cent of coral reefs. Climate change is loading the dice for more extremes like heat, extreme fire weather, marine heat waves leading to coral bleaching and more. Mr Gross says there's still uncertainty about some climate change impacts. For example, northern Australia could be getting wetter or it could possibly get drier. He says the world's warming trajectory is unlikely to change within the next 10 years, but whether global emissions are reduced this decade will make a big difference to the longer-term future. We're now perhaps off the very highest worst-case pathway and the pledges and the trajectory looking forward is looking good, but we need to make sure that that actually becomes a reality rather than just a pledge. And finally tonight, a little bit of light relief. A Colorado man has earned some bragging rights. He can now call himself a pinball wizard after becoming this year's world champion. And it's not the first time. Daniel Kruter has more. This is where we keep all our pinball machines. 19-year-old Escher Lefkoff has been fascinated with pinball before he could even walk. I kind of just watched the ball roll around while my dad played on just drool on the glass. There's a picture of me on the chair. Since then, he's become a lot taller and a lot better. The shelf here is the first place trophies. The newest is right here. I just won from the Worlds this year. He played on a machine he lost tournaments on before. Flash Gordon. I've always struggled on that game. I told my dad right before, I'm like, whatever happens, happens. I'm going to do my best, but, you know, it's Flash Gordon. When the last ball drained, his bonus points started racking up. All I could do was stand there and watch as the score slowly ticked up, and I stood there with my fists out, like, oh, come on, please, please. He got it! And you won by a relatively slim margin, right? Yep, yeah, uh, less than 1% of the score difference. As players will tell you, there's no luck in pinball. Everything's earned, including his new title, Open World Champion. Does it ever lose its novelty being handed the first place? No, not really. It's, it's still wonderful to win. There's so many good players now and there's so much competition. Every single first place you have to truly earn. He's hoping pinball can attract new fans and competitors in the future. Right now, tournaments are put on by pinball players themselves. They supply their own games and put all this effort into it, and they don't make any money. They do it for the love of pinball. Uh, before we go, a little bit of housekeeping. Some of you are asking about um, getting rid of your flood rubbish and are you supposed to take it to the dump, especially if you don't have cars that are working. So let's just um, let you know what the council's had to say. This from the Mayor of Auckland. So you can drop off storm-related waste for free at nine participating transfer stations throughout the region. So check out the website. So nine of them are participating. You can drop off for free if, if it is storm-related waste. They are operating an honesty system. So they're asking you, please, um, if others have a greater need than you, and it's not storm-related, please don't take it out and dump it um, at the dump right now because they need that for storm-related waste. So check out the details of those transfer stations online. If you don't have a car or your car's out of action, um, 300 council staff and contractors are working from today to remove storm waste from road size. Now, this is a last resort, and they say please only put the stuff on the side of the road if you have no vehicle to get to a transfer station and no other way of disposing it. Um, and you can call, and I'll give you the number, 08 800 2222 to talk about the options. 0800 2222 um, Thirdly, they are going to deliver skips um, to areas and streets of highest need. Uh, there'll be volunteers as well to help from that. And they say more details of where and when those skips will be placed will be out announced tomorrow at their 8am briefing. 
Just a reminder, this is from the Mayor's office and still from insurance companies as well. Be careful what you dispose of because some companies will require to see the damaged property before paying out on your claims. So check before you get rid of it. Take photos if you need to. Don't throw it out until you are sure of the situation. Now, um, that's about all we've got time for. The Late News team's going to keep you updated throughout the evening. And don't forget, if you missed anything from the programme, you can find Checkpoint on Spotify, Apple or wherever you get your podcast from. Ko te kaupapa tuatahi popo. Tomorrow from 5am, first up is going to talk to a 77-year-old pensioner, pensioner who called her housing provider for help in Friday's floods and they sent a plumber and told her to take shelter on her bed. Do tune in for that one, 5am tomorrow. Now, there's been a lot going on today, so kawa e wariwari te ata tero i a mato kōrero. All our videos and stories will be online. Do check them out, catch up on anything you missed. Stay safe. Thank you for joining us for this Checkpoint special. We'll catch you again tomorrow. RNZ News at 7 o'clock. Good evening. Ngā mihi o te pō ko Ivy Ashton tēnei. The new Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, has helped give Labour a bump in the latest One News Kantar public poll. In one of a pair of polls taken since Mr Hipkins took office, Labour has risen five points to 38, while National is on 37%, down one. ACT is on 10%, while the Greens sit on seven. Translating to seats in the House, the left bloc would have 58 seats, while the centre-right parties would have 60, both short of the 60 61 needed to form a majority. That means, assuming Dawudi Waititi holds his Waiadiki seat, Te Pāti Māori holds the balance of power to avoid a hung parliament. In the preferred Prime Minister stakes, Mr Hipkins enters on 23%, while Christopher Luxon is on 22 The poll covers the period of Chris Hipkins' first five days since officially taking office from January the 25th to the 29th. Auckland Emergency Management is urging people not to be complacent in the face of further bad weather. Met Service has issued a series of orange and red heavy rain warnings for Northland, Auckland, Coromandel and for Bay of Plenty from tomorrow. Duty Controller Rachel Kelleher says there is still potential for further disruption. We shouldn't be complacent about that orange warning because it still could be that with the rainfall we experience um, in some of the other parts of the region, that given the sodden ground conditions, it can be enough to be problematic. Rachel Kelleher says the Henderson area catchment had already received over 600 millimetres of rain in the past four days. She says this is half of the yearly average for the Auckland region. Civil Defence for the Coromandel Peninsula is reluctantly asking people to stay away from the region this week. The Waikato Regional Council has issued a red heavy rain warning because of the risk of landslides with more rain forecast. Thames Coromandel Civil Defence Controller Gary Towler says the peninsula is saturated. At the moment, you can get along the eastern seaboard, so pretty much from Matarangi, Whangapoa, all the way down to Wangamata. If you want to leave the Coromandel, I think that road is still open at the moment. But everywhere else, it's just, it's very dangerous and slips come down at a moment's notice and they're going to continue for the, for the rest of the week at least. Gary Towler says if the sun comes out by the weekend, visitors will be welcome to return. A South Auckland community leader describes Auckland Council's handling of the flood emergency as disgraceful. Dave Letelli has told Checkpoint that the lack of teamwork and leadership on the council meant many families were left to fend for themselves. He has called for Mayor Wayne Brown to resign. Mr Letelli says the emergency was an opportunity for the Mayor to stand up and he didn't. He says he's been delivering food to hard-hit homes and while community support has been great, many families still need basic supplies. Mr Brown told a media conference this afternoon he will not resign. An Auckland primary school that is sheltering two dozen people affected by the flood says delaying the school start is the right decision, but it could put more stress on parents. Schools were due to reopen from tomorrow through to Tuesday next week, but the Ministry of Education has directed all Auckland schools, ECE and tertiary institutions to remain shut until February the 7th. Wesley Primary School planned to open this Friday and Principal Lou Reddy says some parents dealing with flood damage will struggle with children at home.
We need to give parents the chance to work on the house and some things you can't do with kids on site. So it might take the pressure. It's a double-edged sword. If we don't open as quickly as possible, it means that parents are under pressure. Lou Reddy says he's worried about the longer-term impact of the flood on families' housing. Some residents in the West Auckland suburb of Titirangi are doing their best to cope after being cut off by a slip. Lucy says the landslide has taken out water and power supplies. She says her family is relying on friends to help with the essentials. We're just trekking out each day and heading up for showers and laundry. And unfortunately, uh, we did a massive shop this week and so the freezers were full. <laughs> so then it was a, oh, no, how do we empty all these freezers? So, um, yeah, there's a lot of lugging backwards and forwards. And Waka Kotahi says a crash has now been clo- has now closed both northbound lanes on State Highway 2 between Petoni and Melling in the Hutt Valley. The road is congested with northbound queues back to the Korokoro Road interchange following the crash at quarter to six. That's the news. Tomorrow on Afternoon with Jesse Mulligan, a good life is a complicated life. It's got highs and lows and it's messy, but it's meaningful and happy and healthy. If you put effort into one thing, not diet, not exercise, not a great career, but relationships with other people. That's what researchers have concluded from one of the most unique studies of human life in the world. I'll speak with the Associate Director of the study tomorrow from 1pm on Afternoons here on RNZ National. And we're on air on rnz.co.nz and on your mobile through the RNZ app. You're with Karen Hay next on Nights. Right now, the short forecast from Met Service to midnight Tuesday. Northland and Auckland. Isolated showers, but rain north of Kaikohe. The rain spreading south tomorrow and becoming heavy with possible thunderstorms. From Waikato to Taranaki, including Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and the central high country. Isolated showers turning to rain in the eastern areas tomorrow. Some heavy falls possible in Coromandel Peninsula tomorrow night. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mainly fine. Isolated showers in Gisborne tomorrow. Whanganui to Wellington, also for Waidadapa. Isolated showers with a few heavy Heavy falls and thunderstorms in Manawatu and Waidadapa, including the Tadadua district, until mid evening. Nelson, Buller, Westland, Marlborough, and Canterbury. Cloudy periods with scattered showers, some possibly heavy and thundery inland during the afternoons and evenings. Low cloud about Canterbury coast for a time tomorrow. Fiordland, Otago, and Southland mainly fine. Scattered showers tomorrow afternoon and evening, some heavy and possibly thundery. And fine weather is forecast for De Kohu. Chatham Islands. The time is six minutes past seven. Our next news and weather is at eight o'clock. Thank you very much, Evie. Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to Nights on RNZ National. I'm Karen Hay, and we're back broadcasting in the RNZ Auckland offices tonight. Hopefully we'll remain here as people in Auckland and the north continue in clean-up mode and preparedness for this coming heavy rain. Uh, there's a sense of trepidation as we wait for this next forecasted bout of weather. Last night in Auckland at about midnight, the rain became very heavy again and I don't think anyone who was awake and heard it wouldn't have been worried. So uh, it's been very distressing over the last few days, to say the least, to find that flooding caused loss of life. And the whole event, as we know, was so unexpected that many people are still in a state of disbelief, uh, feeling very vulnerable. Uh, But the resilience over the last few days has been incredible to witness. Uh, As I was getting home on Friday night in West Auckland, that was touch and go with this monsoon-like rain. I saw people in chest-high water trying to clear stormwater drains with brooms, uh, spades. There were kids out helping direct traffic. Well, those same people were there 24 hours later. They were absolutely exhausted. Uh, And, of course, we now have an ever-increasing number of red and yellow stickered homes. And what a Herculean task by the emergency services. Fire, ambulance, police, civil defence, power crews, they've been working non-stop since Friday, so thank you. Uh, And the key issue now is preparing.